Hello, it is Riona Tina. I am here to read from my book. So, December 19th, a woman of a certain age. Men don't make passes at crones with big asses. Sybil Shepherd. <laughs> Grow older, I shall. Grow older gracefully, I shall try. Grow into a crow over my dead body. Crone. What an ugly word to describe such a creative chapter in a woman's story. But no woman need become a crone if she doesn't want to. You can be a wise woman without being a hag. Personally, I think invoking the image of a crone as a figure to emulate diminishes a woman's sense of well-being rather than enhances it. The French call feminine act two players woman of a certain age, and that describes a lot of women very succinctly. We become more certain of ourselves as our authenticity emerges. When it comes to a choice between Lena Horne's sexy chuckle, or Madame Mim's gleeful cackle, I'm much more inspired by the lady and her music than by the lady with her magic spells. I think it's vital for us to change the concept of feminine aging from invisible to vibrant, because a sweeping societal, ch societal change is waiting in the wings as the millennium approaches. Fasten your seatbelts, boys. Some of you are in for a bumpy ride as the century of women begins. By the year 2000, 42% of all adult American women will be 50 or older. However, we really don't have to wait to start making an attitude adjustment about second acts. We can start today. Contemporary women are already redefining the midlife passage that Gail Sheehy calls the flaming fifties. After five years of research for her book, New Passages, Mapping Your Life Across Time, she's discovered that the women of the 1990s are in their fifties. And from a look at the company she keeps, Barbara Streisand, Linda Ellerby, Janet Reno, Judy Collins, Lauren Hutton, Jane Fonda, Martha Stewart, Donna Shalala, Judith Jameson, Barbara Boxer, and Tina Turner, the 50-something decade sizzles. Women at this stage of life find themselves blazing with energy and accomplishment as never before in history. The struggles that sap so much of their emotional energy have subsided by now. The results of Sheehy's research strongly suggest that the dominant influence on a woman's well-being is not income level or marital status. The most decisive factor is age. Older is happier. Coco Chanel reminds us that nature gives you the face you have when you are 20. Life shapes the face you have at 30. But it is up to you to earn the face you have at 50. As long as the face staring back at you is authentic, you can call yourself anything you want to. But you'll find me hanging out backstage with white red-hot chanteuses, not my cronies. The game, glad game reconsidered. Be good, be glad. Be brave, Eleanor Hodgman Porter. Bah humbug, you can't mean that four days before Christmas. Oh yes you can, especially four days before Christmas. This morning the nest test that tries women's souls commences. As with Christmas's past, this year the test will be multiple choice. Who sleeps where? Who cooks what? Who gets custody of Christmas morning? Which gifts haven't arrived? Which gifts yet haven't been sent? Who picks people up at the airport? Who checks into Bedlam? 
Suddenly, Ebenezer Scrooge seems like the most maligned and misunderstood figure in literature. But I know someone whose literary reputation needs rehabilitation even more than Scrooge's. Remember Pollyanna, the glad girl? Now don't snicker at the thought of her name. Pollyanna's clawing determination to find the good in any situation might seem too saccharine to swallow four days before Christmas, but I think the instructions to her glad game should be festively wrapped and put under every woman's tree. Sneer if you must, but the glad game is the perfect antidote when a holiday problem flares up suddenly. Pollyanna did not pretend that everything was good, her creator, Eleanor Hodgman Porter, insists. Instead, she represented a cheery, courageous acceptance of the facts. She understood that unpleasant things are always with us, but she believed in mitigating them by looking for whatever good there is in what is. When Polly Ra Pollyanna was originally published in 1913, no one was more shocked than Mrs. Porter at the sudden and widespread appeal of her 11-year-old orphan's ability to find a silver lining in any black cloud. Although the book was published without any publicity, word of mouth recommendation made it a bestseller, eventually sell selling over a million copies. Pollyanna was translated into a dozen languages and was so popular that the character's name entered the English vernacular to describe irrepressible optimism. In the novel, Pollyanna Whittier is the daughter of an impoverished missionary who continually preaches the sermon of gladness to anyone who will listen. The Reverend Whittier points out that the Bible records 800 instances of God instructing his children to be glad and rejoice. Obviously, the Reverend concludes, he must have wanted us to live that way, at least some of the time. One Christmas, these beliefs are put to a severe test. When the annual holiday hamper arrives from the Missionary Ladies Aid Society, Pollyanna has asked for a real China doll for Christmas. But when she opens the hamper on Christmas morning, she finds that the good ladies have mistakenly sent her a pair of children's crutches instead. Naturally, she feels devastated. In an effort to comfort her, the Reverend makes up a game to see if they can find one good thing about receiving a pair of crutches as a Christmas gift. Of course, they do. Pollyanna doesn't need them. Thus, the glad game is created. After Pollyanna's father dies, she's sent to live with her Aunt Polly Harrington, a wealthy but lonely spinster. No one doubts that the reason Miss Polly never married in a very stern and unpleasant personality. When Pollyanna arrives in the little Vermont town, she soon transforms the community with her spunk and good cheer. The sick become well, but lonely find friends and sweethearts. Unhappy marriages are saved. Everyone except Aunt Polly succumbs to looking for life's bright side. But Aunt Polly remains a hard nut to crack. At one point she explodes, Will you stop using that everlasting word glad? It's glad, glad, glad. From morning till night, until I think I shall go wild. A response one could imagine sharing occasionally. However, even Aunt Polly comes under the glad spell. After Pollyanna has a serious accident and only pulls, pulls through because of her own pluck and the goodwill of the community. Pollyanna may be hopelessly sentimental, old-fashioned, and outdated as a novel, but this business about 800 reassurances to cheer up, it's not so bad, deserves reconsideration. Perhaps this is exactly the nugget of good news we should meditate on as we deck the halls and roll out the red carpet. 
seasonal sawcraft. If in each season as it passes, breathe air, drink the drink, taste the fruit, and resign yourself to the influences of each. Let them be your only diet drink and botanical medicines. Henry David Thoreau The winter air outside is thin and bracing, sharp, frigid, icy, stinging. We do not saunter. The pace of our steps is quick, mirroring on the outside the accelerated forward motion within as holiday preparations take center stage. Once we close the door, the winter air is warm, heavy, and aromatic. Wood burning, fresh evergreen, spicy cinnamon and ginger, breathe in deeply the fragrances of contentment. In winter we live in anticipation. Friends come in from the cold to be embraced by the convivial chaos of our family's annual holiday open house. All year long I dream about your homemade eggnog, I guess confides as sulfur gifts are exchanged. Heartfelt compliments and a cup of cheer. In the kitchen, frothy hot wassail. Spiced cider and dark English ale is ladled into cups, ransoming hands and hearts from winter's chill. The dining room table groans good-naturedly from the bounty of abundance. Roast turkey, baked ham, cheeses, fresh breads. Children of all ages crowd around seasonal sweets and winter's fruits. Candy canes and sugar plums, pumpkin, mints, and apple pie. Soul, sip, and savor. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry in this season of joy. The most ancient spiritual wisdom was centered around the predictable shifts in seasonal energies. Rituals evolved around sowing, reaping, and the cycles of light and darkness. John Bari Senko the respected scientist, gifted therapist, and unabashed mystic, reminds us in her tiny contemplative jewel, pocket full of miracles, prayers, meditations, and affirmations to nurture your spirit every day of the year. The seasonal rhythms correlate with our bodily rhythms. Our dream life and inner life grow more insistent in the wintry darkness the old year is put to bed. One's business is finished, and the harvest of spiritual maturity is reaped as wisdom and forgiveness. For centuries, Eastern healers, particularly practitioners of Chinese medicine, have taken into consideration the impact the seasons have on our bodies, minds, and souls. But the symbiotic relationship between human beings and nature has virtually been ignored by Western medicine until recently. Now physicians acknowledge that some people suffer from a deep depression in the winter because they're extremely sensitive to darkness. Light therapy restores their subtle energies to a healthy balance. Learning the soul craft of seasonal, seasonal healing bring new depth to our journey toward wholeness. In the natural world, winter is the season of rest, restoration, and reflection. There's not much of that going on this week, but after the holidays are behind us, consider how you spend whatever time you have at your personal disposal. And if you have as little as I think you do, reflect on how you can change that next year. The 12th century German mystic Hildegard of Bingen suggests a simple way for us to begin exploring the richness of seasonal soul craft. Glance at the sun, see the moon and the stars, gaze at the beauty of Earth's greetings. Now, think. And that's a reading from my book. Merry Christmas, everyone. Bye.